All right, welcome back to Problem Solver Politics. I'm your host, Cardinalis, with Cody the Oracle. Howdy, everyone. And today we are going to do a very fast podcast about four of Andrew Yang's policy proposals. We're going to knock out a bunch um, in our quest to converse over all 90 plus of uh, the policy proposals on his platform. These are the following reducing packaging waste, the robo calling text line, the timing of payments for small businesses sounds like a big yawn, but it's not. And interestingly enough, the head of culture and ceremony for the United States of America. So why don't we start out with reducing packaging waste? All right. This is very interesting and as a scuba diver and an environmentalist, this actually hits home with me. Packaging waste has hit epidemic proportions in this country. It's not rare to see individual oranges wrapped in plastic containers at local food stores. Plastic waste is growing by around 4% per year while recycling is decreasing. Now he points out we used to ship all of our trash to China, which has now outlawed that. So we're either shipping it to countries that can't handle it or are dumping it in the ocean, which is a major environmental problem because the most commonly littered thing that we find, especially in our oceans, is a plastic bag. So he suggests we need to pass a national extended producer responsibility bill or find a way to shift the cost of disposing of these materials onto the manufacturers. If they pass the cost on to the consumers, each of us can make an informed decision about whether we really want to pay for the amount of packaging that producers are currently using for their goods. Now, this is where I think Andrew Yang actually goes a little bit wrong and he's going down the road of people that want to tax gun manufacturers for gun deaths. And if a man is suicidal and has a chemical de uh, independency right. and he decides to uh, slit his wrist with a razor blade, I don't sue the razor blade company because I recognize this is, this is a mental health issue on behalf of the suicidal person. Dude, I, I don't think individually wrapping oranges is exactly on the same yeah, level yeah, but as that's also manufacturing <laughs> a fire. I think like we make firearms is different yeah. than we wrap our oranges in pieces of plastic individually so they're not stolen. Like, well, no, let's talk not, to the guy who's got his agricultural license, but I would all say right? This is that's apples to, and, that's that's to apples stop and bruising in the transportation process. Okay, same thing, same difference. The, sorry we manufacture rifles is different than sorry we put each orange in a piece of plastic. I okay. think one I think one It is, is excessive. Now, <laughs> I, as I said, I'm an environmentalist and a scuba diver. So I agree wholeheartedly that our plastics are excessive. But I got to tell you, to me this is a spiritual fix that America well, needs. Also, our consumerism is to blame, not the producers. How to we how do we curb America's consumerism that demands everything shiny. Well, but, but also what he's, and again, I, I mean, I just want to get back to what he's actually proposing. This is actually what he wants to do, right? So what he's actually okay. proposing is to direct the EPA to research and promote the best means of, of reducing wasteful packaging. Because the EPA is great at researching things. But, I mean, Never mind the top three natural well, disasters of the past decade well, it's, it's have been a, at the hand of the EPA. It's the federal government. Who else the federal, like, who else the federal government have? It's the EPA. That's who they go to. Anyway. Um, how about they fund third parties that are private that do a better job? How about this? I, I guess, and we'll have to do some more research into this. Maybe we can do a follow-up video on this, but... Uh, oh, by the way, that was not white power. Well, all right. That was okay. I'm a scuba diver. All regardless, right. They can't see it anyway. Regardless. <laughs> um, the, uh, this is, there's been bills, I guess, in Indiana and Washington state where something like this has been put forth already. So maybe that could be a follow up video we could do. It's interesting to me. Cause I, I do. I mean, anyone, anyone who has kids, I think it's still the same as when I was a kid, when you get like toys for kids, like things that come with like blister it's packs. It's excessive. Yeah. There's like 15 of those little twisty things. And there's, there's, there's pieces of plastic that are just wedged in between Dude, where how batteries you go. go? To a restaurant, uh, the spoons in its own plastic bag, the napkins in its yeah. own plastic well, hey, bag, don't the worry, fork man. is. Don't worry, man. We don't have no more straws. So, cause yeah. we're, 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 where we live, that's happened multiple times. I've got in my car. I'm like, did they forget to give me it? And I'm like, oh, if you don't ask, I don't give them anymore. Anyway, moving forward, I want to get to the one that I'm probably the most passionate about. Robocalling? Robocalling. This All is, right, this hit is, us. This is absurd, man. Um, honestly, I'm going to skip past this. Everyone knows that it's a total annoyance when you get a phone call from a marketer. So I just want to get down to what he's going to propose. And <laughs> as president, I will initiate a robocalling text line, which would be 800 robocall, to which all citizens can forward any number that makes a marketing call they found offensive or a waste of time. The FCC would then investigate any complaints and levy significant fines to repeat offenders. This is like my dream right here, man. I cannot tell you. I mean, just the goals right here. Provide a disincentive to excessive robocalling. Maintain our receptivity to genuine outreach. But that's a big one, man. This is the government. This is 
is there any more layup for the government to make friends with the citizens than to get rid of <laughs> robocalls? Is there, is there any easier way to get in the good graces of your people than to initiate a way for them to reach out to you through their phone okay. and say, this person won't stop calling me and harassing me? I think that's it's beautiful, man. This is, this is where the emotional side of my brain is saying, dude, I hate robocallers. You know, and and if you wanted to outlaw that cheese, no complaints from me. Is However, there another opinion? is there an, is there another point? To, I hate robocallers. Is there, is there is there actually another opinion on that? No, I love them. We love them. <laughs> robocallers of the bomb dot com. Yes, we just said that on Problem Solver Politics, no, but strongly um, disagree. <laughs> yeah, but I, I do have to say, I really already feel like there's a built in market solution for this. And I, for example, I've just bought the app from Verizon. I'm sure there's probably a freeware version out there, but I got pitched the Verizon one where it identifies robocalls and potential spam. And you can report if it didn't show up as potential spam, you can report it and then it'll tell all the others that this is a spam line. And I've noticed my annoyance has been reduced. However, it does kind of bother me a little bit. How many times at work I get interrupted and even if I'm able to look at my phone and see that it is potential spam, that, that thought process I was engaged in was interrupted and lost. And as a guy that's engaged in creative script writing or is engaged in other processes where your thoughts actually matter, then um, that, that can be a huge annoyance. So this is something where I well, want to see exactly specifics of what he proposed but before why, I said yes. Why can't the federal government just do what you described Verizon doing instead for free for everyone? I don't see, I, I do not see the downside to the federal government doing this service instead of, instead so of Verizon. So for it's a thumbs up? And, and you know, it's a thumbs up, man. I am, <laughs> I am, I am not a fan of any federal government in the world. However, I'm a big fan of any government doing this to get my approval. Dude, that's funny. That's All like, right. You so want to, you want to win people over that aren't a fan, do something like this, do stuff that actually matters in their life. So, you know, I bet you if somebody was just a presidential or were just a presidential candidate saying I'll cure traffic and I'll end robocalls, Yeah. They might just be the most popular person right. in the United I, States you, of America. I, it's one of those things where you feel like maybe just being outside, maybe it's for some reason it's so obviously impossible. No one's tried it. But why has nobody ever ran and even statewide, I'm sure they have. But I, I have not been pitched r someone running on traffic. And honestly, man, who isn't impacted by traffic? I think that's a pretty good, pretty good thing. I mean, right. Obviously, so, it can't be your only platform, but it's a, not bad. As a small business owner myself, we'll dedicate only 30 seconds to this. But it's very interesting. And this is one of the things that makes me feel more comfortable with Andrew Yang. If he were to become the Democrat nominee, simply because I wish Democrats were more pro-business and less anti-religion, okay? And this is something that makes me think he's a pro-business guy. He says, small businesses are often surviving month to month, especially in their early years. Yep, I can agree to that. Anybody that's a serial entrepreneur knows that they are, they are a small fire to be kindled, not... Um, well, again, that's it. I mean, we were talking, we brought this up in the Freedom Dividend uh, video. It's one of the great things for small business owners about that extra $1,000 a month is it's kind of your little something no matter what when you're running a business even if you're bleeding money you get that little yeah. bit each month to live on and so he points out that they can't afford to have a payment delayed or go through a lengthy litigation process to collect on a contract they're also often in a position where they're trying to build relationships with bigger clients very true and big corporations on the other hand often play fast and loose with the timing of payments because they know small businesses can't a resort to legal recourse and also don't have lawyers on retainer in case there's a dispute my father worked for a very large corporation that wouldn't pay um, for more than 30 to 60 days because they were floating the money for investments and why pay for 60 days when you can collect on that money on investments and as a small business owner I've been chasing for 90 days this company that owes me for a nearly $3,000 job that I did for them that I aggressively sought after and wanted because I need that income but when I have to wait 90 days for it it's difficult because I've already paid my employees I've already paid the workers comp on I've already paid the insurance on it I'm out like $1,500, $2,000 just trying to collect three you know what I'm saying? That gets really, really difficult. And if you think about it, though it may be legal in many respects, it's unethical and would not be how I would conduct business if I were a big business. So that one's interesting. Well, just really quickly, I just want to really quickly breeze through at the end of this. Uh, as uh, Andrew Yang, in his own words, says, as president, I will work with Congress to pass a law requiring any company with more than 1,000 employees or $50 million in annual revenue 
if fulfillment is not in dispute, to pay any invoice from a company with less than $5 million in revenue or fewer than 100 employees within 60 days of the date agreed upon or pay a rate of 7% annualized interest per month on the overdue payment, which will continue during any period of litigation if the small business is successful in providing its claim, which is a mouthful. Basically, yeah, he would, there would be, uh, like always, he backs it up with some kind of legislation to be implemented that would say, hey, larger companies can't do exactly what you described. Just say, hey, we'll pay you, we'll, we'll, we'll pay you when we pay you because what are you going to do about it? Which is essentially yeah. what happens. Anyway, yeah, let's get on to the last one. Yeah, that one's got a thumbs up from me. And this next one, <laughs> this, this next one, I just think of the fake bard <laughs> that announced the birth of not Meghan Markle's kid, but the first uh, Prince William child. With uh, uh, it's Kate new to Middleton, me. It's new. Oh, yeah. you know the guy that showed up in the old English garb and said, "We announced today the birth." That guy was a fake. He oh. wasn't actually from the from the from an English delegation or anything. But he like looks that. so. What's the point of having a royal family if you don't get to have like collars and stuff? Dude, that's what, what I'm mean? saying. But he looked so legit yeah. that like the security and like their version of the Secret Service just let him walk to the front. And he's like, "I have the transcripts for the announcement." And it was really just like our buddy Jess Weber. In a complete and total fake outfit, it was royal. We'll sh- we'll give you a link below. Hey, but anyway, family should hire that guy. They're messing up, man. They need a they need a herald, right? Is that what you call that? A herald. That was the it, word. It, yeah. Not a bard. No, Sorry. It's a herald. It's a, yeah, a, a collar of sorts. Yeah. All right. So anyway, he suggests a head of culture and ceremony, suggesting that there are many draws on the president's time, promoting an agenda, meeting with legislators, directing an executive branch, receiving briefings, and keeping America safe from enemies, both foreign and domestic. Oh, and pardoning turkeys. He would like to womp, womp. <laughs> he would like to cut out the pardoning of turkeys from the president's uh, list of duties, shall we say. And he says, while certain ceremonial aspects of the presidency are important, they pale in comparison to the work done each and every day. In addition, a number of cultural or ceremonial events in this diverse and popular populous country is huge, and the president can't possibly make appearances at all of them. So he suggests appointing a head of culture and ceremony so the president can have a surrogate dedicated specifically to attending these important cultural touchstones. Now, he says this will increase the number of events the office of the president can be represented at, represented at, and it will allow someone to be selected for the talents required to maximize these values, so on and so forth. But to a certain extent, this is one that I say I don't agree with, not because I think it's a bad idea to want to make the president more productive, but I think... Look at how much the presidency ages these men. They are obviously swamped in stress and these important um, aspects of their job. I I think it's okay presidents go to a lot of these things um, as a welcome relief to celebrate in the culture of these people. The White House is the people's house. The president is the people's legislator, or sorry, the people's executive. And to a certain extent, I think we already have a head of, cu- of culture and ceremony. That's always kind of traditionally been the first lady's job, has I, it not? I, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, that, that sounds like that. What he's describing here sounds exactly like what, generally speaking, the first, I mean, really the first spouse, you know, we haven't had a woman president yet. But yeah, but that first, the, whoever's the, you know, married to the president, like, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of, it's their house. That's why, you know, they get to do it. They get to introduce and welcome people. But I also think that. Also, the vice president gets sent all the time. For VPN. example, George Bush was going to talk at our, not our coronation, our graduation when I was in college. And it ended up being that Dick Cheney showed up. And well, so but, I think there's already plenty of people. But what about also, this is something I, I, I think kind of getting back to your point a little bit. I think if you do have someone who generally can handle this stuff for you. You know, like, let's say you really honestly just, you know, no offense to all the the great people out there that are big hockey fans. Like, I don't care about the NHL. Don't care. Okay. I, I'm busy. I can't be there to meet the winner of the Stanley Cup. I, I don't want to have to completely change my trip from Europe and my meetings here because I, 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 I will have someone else handle that. Yeah, you know the Call of Duty championships, you'd be there. Well, not, not Call of Duty. <laughs> but what I'm saying, though, is uh, honestly and personally, I if I was president, I would love to be any sports team. But uh, an aside, what I'm saying is, it can then in turn kind of create an opportunity for the president where you're like, you know, normally I don't have to go to these things, but what's a better relief? What's a better release? What's a better way to kind of just unwind than by surprise show up 
surprise the winners of the World Series. Everyone will say, oh, look, the president's here. Oh, he isn't here for this kind of stuff. Shake some hands, kiss some babies, make people happy. Like, I think it creates another opportunity for the president to kind of surprise people and make that connection. I, I, I do, though, agree and, with you. And the truth it, is— It worries me a little bit, the idea of having a face for the president. So the president can be back behind the scenes <laughs> doing whatever he wants, yeah. being however he wants, and some guy comes out, and Tom Hanks comes out and says, hey, the president's great. That, that weirds me out. I don't like that. Yeah, well, also, any president and any politician worth his salt is going to understand that these are the things that get you reelected. These are the things that make you lovable. Love him or hey, hate him. Trump stunt with the fast food during the uh, during the the shutdown for the uh, the NCAA football champs. Remember that? Uh, yeah, that, I do remember dude, that. That one that, that was kudos. People loved it. Yeah, and also Barack Obama. I had a huge amount of respect for Barack Obama because he was the first president to show up on late night television, and that's a good move. It makes you more accessible to your people. He was the first standing president to show up okay, on late but, night but, television. Okay, so but where do you rank that between uh where do you rank him being on late night TV with uh with George W. Bush throwing out the first pitch at Yankee Stadium in the first game in New York after 9 11? Where do you rank those two? Dude, post 9 11, there was nobody greater than George Bush. Highest the approval, scientific stats ever. Prove that. Everyone loved the president after that. Yeah, but. everybody loved the president after that. They loved him standing on the rubble. I mean, his his approval numbers were almost 90% at that time. So anyway, um, I just think the head of culture and ceremony is unnecessary. I think uh, politicians wouldn't necessarily want it. And I think it's what makes uh, the presidency beautiful is a lot of the cultural things that he engages in. And it's one of the few nonpartisan things we can do. I think our country needs a lot of this pomp and circumstance because whether or not you agree or disagree with Donald Trump, uh, you know, him showing up and pardoning that turkey is something all Americans can agree on. So let's not get rid of the turkey ceremony. Yeah, well, yeah, I agree kind of along those same lines. It just kind of dehumanizes the office. You don't get to see him as much. That Normally when you get that human touch from the president, it would be replaced by the, the court gesture. And yeah, I don't think that's a good idea either. So I agree. I think it's kind of a little bit dehumanizing, really. We should be seeing the president pardoning turkeys. I, I do, again, I honestly think, in hindsight, that stunt Donald Trump pulled with the fast food and the college football players is going to be one of the things he's known for more than anything when his uh, thing ends. It was just so bizarre, so weird. It, was, it, it happened to be so on point. He knew it. High school, college football players were like, oh, yeah, McDonald's. So I think... <laughs> Just ha- and again. Hey, what are you saying about us high school athletes? But I'm just saying, agree, hey. agree or disagree, the idea that it creates moments for the president to do little things, again, it creates those opportunities for the president to really kind of show who they are and be humanized. Taking that away would be unfortunate. So, I don't know. I agree with you on that one. Not, I don't agree with you on the packaging. Get rid of it. <laughs> Robocalls, get rid of them. But this one, I agree. All right, so please like and share this video. Continue the conversation below. Let us know what you're thinking about all these policy proposals proposals, and any videos you want us to make in the future. This is Problem Solver Politics.